and uh, I would uh, want you to be as attentive as possible. Now, look at these organisms that we have. We have a rabbit, we have a cow, we have a tiger, we have a mushroom, we have uh, an antelope, we have uh, a lizard, we have a bird, we have uh, uh, a, a bacteria. All of these are organisms that we need to name and assign them groups. So why do we have a classification system? Because we really want us to have a single universal name. Man should be man, whether you're in Europe or in UK or in Asia or where. We want to have a single agreeable universal names. And therefore we are going to group organisms according to their origin. Two, we want to avoid confusion, confusing different organisms with others. And therefore it is very important, especially in breeding, like in plant and animals. And then it also enables us to understand how living things relate to one another. How? Because we need to know about the evolutionary origin, the evolutionary trend of different organisms. And therefore it also enables us to understand clearly how these organisms share a common ancestral origin and therefore how they can be related in terms of, by the way, even drug discovery, sometimes vaccination would require extracting certain chemicals from other organisms that are closely related to man and then culturing them such that we can get the vaccines. Just like we are doing in the case of coronavirus, people are extracting certain plasma of, a, of, of, of a plasma in, in, in chimpanzees, and then they are treated with the corona virus, and then they are inactivated, and they are the ones that are now being used for the vaccination of humans. So we have several branches of taxonomy. We have what we call nomenclature, which is about giving the names to different organisms. And then the second branch of taxonomy is called systematics. Systematic means placing organisms into groups basing on their similarities and differences. Now, those that have close similarities are always put as members of the same taxa. Take taxa talks about the hierarchy, different levels in which organisms exist. But systematics means that we are placing them in groups basing on their similarities and their differences. So we have what we call the binomial nomenclature. Binomial nomenclature means that we are giving each species or each organism two names. One is the Latin name, which we call the generic name. And the second one is a specific name. So all these organisms, have different binomial systems of classification. Now, the first word, like you've learned this maybe earlier in your secondary school days, the first name is actually what we call the generic name. That is the genus of the organism. And then the second name is the species name or the, the real name. So the generic name starts with an uppercase starts with a capital letter. For example, if you look at what we are calling the Homo sapiens, these Homo sapiens uh, starts with capital H, and then the sapiens starts with what? With the, a small letter. Sometimes if you are writing, you are supposed to put it in italics. So the Homo, which is the generic name, starts with capital and then the sapiens name, which is the species name. So we now become homo sapiens. Homo meaning that the class of man and then the sapiens now relates to exactly that specific species. So we have like in that homo group, we have the homo sapiens, which is the one with the brain. And then we have the homo erectus, like the ones we have in chimpanzees and then in monkeys. So this system, of binomial name nomenclature, maybe for the background was invented by Carl Linus. And uh, when we are writing, 
it must be underlined or in italics. And then uh, we use Latin languages because they are the origin. So the key examples, we have the Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens has two things. The genus is the Homo. The sapiens is the species. Now, Homo sapiens means wise man because there are other sapiens which are not wise. They are not able to communicate. They are not able to use their the brains. The brains are not well developed. So we now call that Homo sapiens meaning wise man as in Latin. Now, what is a species according to you? It is a group of organisms having common features. Mm. Yeah, it is a group of organisms having common, having common features and can breed to produce fertile offspring. That is very good. We are saying that when you're talking about species, they are organisms with similar characters that can breed. Actually, the breeding should result into viable or fertile offsprings. So if we look at the definition that is on the screen, we are saying that one, a species must be able to breed successfully. Successful breeding means that they produce viable and fertile offsprings. These offsprings must be able to reproduce again. That is what we call a, a species. Then they must have unique features they must be similar to others of the same species. And then the most important, which is chemical in nature, is that they must have similar DNA. And this DNA must be different to other species. Actually, it should be 100% similar to organisms of the same species. So one is that they must have successful breeding, resulting to viable and fertile offsprings. Number two, they must have features which are similar to others of the same species. And then they must have similar DNA to others of the members of the same species. You can see that for us and chimpanzees, we have a DNA which is about 97%, which we share. But the 3% is big enough to ensure that we and then the chimpanzees are of different species. So we are going to look at what we call taxonomic hierarchy meaning that placing organisms in a descending order. Of course, you know the system that we start with, the kingdom. The kingdom is the largest taxa. By the way, there can be levels beyond this. After the kingdom, we may have an ecosystem. After the ecosystem, may, we may have the entire universe. So it, it keeps on moving out. And then there are also levels which are below the species. Below the species, we have the cell, the tissues, we have the cells, and then we have cell organelles. So all of them are hierarchies that gives. But for the purpose of taxonomy, we use features that we are able to see naturally. And therefore, we start with the kingdom, then we go to the phylum, then we go to the class, then we go to the order, then we go to the family, the genius, and then the species. So each group in that hierarchy is actually called a taxon. So each taxon has certain characteristics. They have features that are unique, that are peculiar to that particular group. If you're talking about the species, it must be what is only present at that species level. And this is going to be very helpful, especially when we have a practical. We look at, at that level, at, at that taxon, what brings something which is common exactly and strictly to that, that, that taxon. For example, if you want to group an organism under the phylum codata, then those organisms must be the only ones that have the backbone. So look at any organism with a backbone, includes the reptiles, include the, the amphibians, include mammals, 
includes birds because all of them have a vertebral colon. So all those organisms would be grouped under the same phylum codata because it is that backbone that gives them specific character, which is different from others. Now, if you're talking about the class, let's say of birds, all birds have fur or feathers on the body and it is very peculiar to birds. And because of that, we classify the class as birds or as eves. So when you are putting at any level, whether it is a species, look at that character, which is not present in all other species, but present on only one that you are classifying. Look at the level like a class. What makes human beings to be classified as mammalia? They have far air, air on their bodies. What makes the, the birds to be classified under one class? Because they all have feathers on their body. And because of that, we now look at that particular character that is present in that taxon. Are we together? Yes. Okay. Now we are going to look at uh, an example of that taxonomic hierarchy. Now let's look at an example of man. So man, we start with the kingdom is animalia. Now let me ask you, why do you think we group man as an animal? Okay. Sorry, teacher, the network, pardon. Why do we group man as an animal or under kingdom animalia? Uh, because it is warm-blooded. Warm-blooded? Kingdom, eh? Yes. No, 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 no. It's correct. All warm-blooded organisms are, even a cow is warm-blooded. Is it man? Is it an animal? Now, I, have, I was explaining to you that for every taxon, you get characteristics that are peculiar, that only falls within the same. So we have so many animals. Some of them are cold-blooded. You think an amphibian, which is a cold-blooded, like a frog, is not an animal? It's an animal. Mm -hmm. So that means that that one cuts across many taxa. So we are talking about those. Now, if you're talking about animals, look at characteristics of animals. They are features which are peculiar. They have sense organs. Eh? They have eyes for seeing. They have a tongue for tasting. They have a limbs for locomotion. Eh? Animals must be able to move from one place to place. Yes. So all of those characters collectively gives us. So if you look at man, does it have the eye? Does man have the ears? Does man really have those sense organs? If they have it, then they can be categorized as mammals, as I mean, as animals. What about goats? What about cows? What about pigs? What about snakes? What about uh, insects? They all have the sense organs. Therefore, all of them will be collectively categorized as 
uh, uh, kingdom animalia. Now look at phylum. Why do we think human beings are put under the phylum codata? They possess a noctocode. There is a notocode, yes. There are many. They have the backbone, which can be felt with the hands when you touch. They have a spinal cord, which is only seen when dissected. They have a brain case. You can touch your skull eh? and feel it. So those are features that, that are observable. So it has a skull or a brain case that protects the brain. They have a spinal cord when dissected. They have a backbone. All these are characters of codex. And then they have a, penta, a pentadactyl limb arrangement. Do you understand when I talk about pentadactyl? No. They are like five digits. You know, in our fingers are five. Eh? Yes. Now, when you look at all of them, if you trace at the root of their limbs, you'll find that they are divided into five. Five. Dactyl means limbs, and then penta is five. So we say they have a pentadactyl limb arrangement. But you know, even cows, you see that they have two hooves. When you remove that one, you'll find that there are five bones, and then they end up into two. When there is a, uh, you look at a goat, you look at any, or any animal, any codex usually have that five digit arrangement, including by the way, even frogs. You see them, they all have the five digit arrangement. Those bones are five in nature. So we say they have a pentadactyl limb arrangement. Why do we group uh, man under the, the phylum mammalia? Warm blooded. Warm blooded. And, and they feed their young ones. Actually, we don't talk about what you don't see. Talk about what what do they use for feeding their young ones? Okay, they are they are hmm? hairy. They have fur covering their body, isn't it? They possess mammary glands. Yes. You know that they all have mammary glands. Yes. Yes, those are the main characters. They have fur or air covering their bodies. They possess mammary glands. Mainly, what we see is actually the teeth that results into leads into a mammary gland. So those are some of the characteristics. Then you keep on moving down the order primates, the families, hominidae, the genus is Homo, and then the species. Is a sapiens. So you should be able to get some few examples of organisms and also classify them. Now, when you look at this, where we now separate from others, the hominidae is the same family that we have with the monkeys, with the chimpanzees, with the all those organisms that are closer. But now at the species level, we separate because we are all members of the homo group, the homo sapiens, the homo erectus. But then as you move down, you find that there are features which are peculiar to us. So we have several ways of classifying organisms. And uh, some are artificial classification, which is actually based on one or few easily observable characters for simplicity. All Africans are dark skinned. That is artificial. All whites are light skinned. All bagandas have long nose. Eh? Uh, I mean, wide nose. All, 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 all uh, uh, banyankoles have long nose. All the northerners are dark skinned. That is too artificial. It may not be give a scientific connotation of. Uh, the classification. So because it doesn't look into details of uh, probably the other characters, the inner characters, the chemical composition, the genetic makeup of such organisms. So that one, we call it artificial classification. We have others which are natural 
classifications and it considers natural relationship between organisms, especially the internal and then the external features. Much as I am dark skinned, but when you look internally, you'll find that all the organs and structures you have, I have. We all have a four chambered heart. We all have five lobes of the liver. We all have two lobes of the lungs. We all have white blood cell. We all have red blood cells. So that becomes natural. We look at the internal and then the external features that are similar. Now, when we look at uh, the main features that determines how organisms are classified, we look at five main features that we are going to look at deeply. So what determines how something is classified? We look at the embryology. Do you understand when I talk about embryology? Eh? No. no. So you're looking at the stages of development. By the way, do you believe that at one point you looked exactly like a fish? Now, let me just show you some few features of embryology. Now, look at this. Are you able to see that? Have you seen the fish? Yes. Can you compare fish yes. and man at the earliest stage of development? That is about one week. Do you see any difference in the first line for all organisms? No. Now you go to the second stage, which is the first trim star. Now you can see the fish developing something like the fins. You can see the salamander developing an external lungs. And then you see a, a tortoise, chicken, and uh, the pig, they are almost all developing along the same way. And by the way, a rabbit is almost like a human being. Now at two months, you see that the chicken and then the turtle, turtle by the way is, a, is another form of a bird. You can see that they are developing beaks. And then you see that the fish and the salamander, they are all developing the code of pins. Now look at the pig and the cow, how they resemble. And then you look at man and the rabbit. Now, when you look at all those arrangements, it is showing you that there is an evolutionary line of development in which these organisms go. But then they keep on deviating until now they reach the species that is. So that is what we call embryology. Embryology talks about the science of what? The, the science, by the way, uh, again, no piece is calling. Let me receive, then I'll get back. Eh? But don't go away. Yes, peace. Hello? Yes. Yes. I was calling to inquire if my dad had sent the money to you uh, if I received it. Not yet, but now we are in a lesson. You'll wait a bit. Mm. I will call you. We are still in a lesson. Okay. So can we continue? Hello? 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 Can we continue? Yes. Okay. So we are looking at that uh, embryology. So I was talking about what determines how something is classified. We look at embryology and now you can now see from here that 
as we look at the stages of development of these organisms, we can now classify uh, man, rabbit, cow, and a pig, looking at their embryological development. Don't you think there is a level where we can put them in the same taxa? Now look at those in the middle, the tata and then the chicken. Don't you think that they can be grouped in the, put in the same category? Now look at the fish, both salamander and then the, the fish are of the same taxa because in their stages of development, they almost resemble one another. And therefore that is what we call embryological classification. Another one is the physiology. The physiology talks about the functioning and the working of the cells, how different cells component interact. And we're also going to look at comparative physiology to show that actually what happens in all human beings are the same. Now we look at their biochemistry, the chemical nature of the organism, which we are also going to look at in details. Then we look at their cell structures, some are unicellular, some are multicellular, some have cell membranes, others don't have, some have cell walls. So because of that, we shall also classify them differently. And then also the behavior. Human beings have a sense to reason and therefore they are classified. Much as we are close to the chimpanzees, but for them, they don't reason. And therefore that behavior puts us in different classes. Now, look at how things are classified we look at their DNA. The DNA is actually the most perfect way of classifying organisms. And then two, you look at the structure. Now, when you look at what I was calling the pentadactyle limb arrangement, are you able to see? Human beings have five digits. When you go to the cat, they also have almost similar arrangement. Now look at the whale which is a fish, they also have five bone arrangement. You're able to see one in yellow, then two, three, four, five. But remember, this is an animal in water. And then that's why even if it looks like a fish, whale is actually an animal. Now look at a bat. It also has one, two, three, and four. So when you look at all of them, they have a pentadactyle arrangement meaning that structurally we can put human beings, cat, whale, bats in the same taxa. And that taxa is codata, meaning that they have backbone arrangement. Now, we may not go to the details of phylogenetic arrangement classification, but normally talks about the history of the organisms. And that is only discovered when we look at the fossils. Now we are going to look at this arrangement of the five kingdom system. Uh, Margaret. Hello? Hello? Yes, hello. Now you will try to follow because all these details of what you are seeing here will be uploaded on the YouTube. Eh? Yes. So you'll be able to get all of this material and then maybe you'll send me a message on the chat box with your number if you're on WhatsApp, then I will be able to forward it to you. So that's why I'm still going a bit faster because I want to cover this so that when other people join, you just continue when you are at par with them. Is it okay with you? Yes. Because I think I'm moving a bit faster. Now we are going to look at the five kingdom system. Now we have the first kingdom, which is bacteria, or we call it Monera. Now, most the old name was called bacteria kingdom, but then the modern name is called Monera, which is actually the simplest kingdom that we have. We have Protista, and at times it is called Protoctista. It is either protista or protoctista. Then we have fungi, kingdom fungi. We have kingdom animalia, and then we have kingdom planti. It is not called plant kingdom. 
It is called Kingdom Plantae. It is not called Animal Kingdom. It is called Kingdom Animalia. At this level, we are strict on that. But uh, Margaret, you will discover that there is this organism called the virus, which cannot fit any kingdom. Why? Because the virus, sometimes it is living, sometimes it is non-living. Do you know that any virus outside the cell is non-living? But inside the cell, it is very active. So they have very simple structure with the some small piece of nucleic acid, which may be a DNA or RNA, but they don't have any cellular structure. They don't have, in fact, they, 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 they don't have any of the cell organelles to make them real cells. And because of that, a virus is actually not considered as a living organism. So when you look at most of the characteristics of viruses, for example, viruses lack cellular structure so we say they are a cellular they lack any structure of the cell they have a free existing dna or rna they just have a strand because of that they cannot actually uh, synthesize their proteins they cannot be able to replicate on their own they can only replicate when they enter into the host cell number two they are the smallest living things which actually when we talk about 200 nanometers, meaning that we divide a millimeter by 1 million to give you the structure. Meaning that even in our laboratory, we can't be able to view a virus. You need a, a, a microscope that is actually digital. Then they are endoparasites because they can only live inside other cells. They cannot live outside the cell. And that's why even when we have coronaviruses in our hands or in our clothes, they don't normally affect us until they enter inside the cell. And then they also depend on the host cell for their reproduction. They cannot reproduce on their own. And then they are highly specific. That's why you hear people talking about human papillona virus. It affects only humans. That's why you hear us talking about human immunodeficiency virus, which also affects only humans. You hear of tomato blight, which also affects only tomato. You hear of cassava mosaic. They are really very specific to the host. Let me first put the charger. My battery is getting Huh? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Are you able to see the screen? Yes. Okay. That is good then. So I was talking about the characteristics of viruses. And uh, like I've told you, 
a, a for the virus we are saying that they depend on the host cells we are saying they are specific and they infect a particular host like i was giving you those that affect humans are human viruses they are those ones that affect let's say cattle like foot and mouth disease all these are viral so they are very specific they recognize and then infect only specific host cells then most viruses enter their host by phagocytosis or pinocytosis that means that they are able to eat the cell walls and then they can actually penetrate the cell once they enter inside the cell then they are capable of of reproducing now there are reasons why we classify viruses as living things remember they are in the borderline between living and non-living things one we consider viruses as living things because they possess genetic materials we say they either have rna or dna all living things must have genetic materials although they cannot reproduce on their own remember they require host cells number two viruses can mutate and therefore can evolve all living things can undergo evolution you are hearing of the variants of coronavirus we had the india variety we have now the delhi we have the delta we have the south african within a short time these coronavirus has mutated very rapidly number three they can carry out protein synthesis in a host cell and this is a characteristic of living organisms and then they are also capable of self-replicating but only when inside the host cell and lastly they can transmit characteristics to the next generation that's why the genetic the genome of a virus can be transferred now these are five main reasons why viruses are considered as living things remember i have said they are in borderline sometimes they are non-living sometimes they are living now why do we think viruses are non-living number one is they can be crystallized you can actually put them out they dry and they become useless and they become inactive they cannot metabolize but again that same virus you are seeing which is crystallized when you put it back in the cell then it definitely they will be able to become living then number two they lack enzyme systems meaning that they cannot synthesize anything on their own they wait for the host cell to synthesize their proteins then they can take it on their rna strand to synthesize other protein then lastly they cannot metabolize on their own they need a host cell for them to do that metabolism now margaret let's look at uh, this generalized structure of a virus by the way all viruses have three main components one is the envelope and that envelope varies a lot depending on which type of the virus that we have some are glycoprotein some are protein in nature some are lipids in nature but that's the reason why we say you can prevent corona by just washing your hands with the soap you have learned about the, the 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 action of soap on lipids breaking down the lipids because coronavirus is made out of a lipid a glycolipid coat so once soap a touches it then it breaks the whole wall and then it exposes the genetic material and therefore the virus is killed so it has a simple outer layer called an envelope and then it has a capsomere which is a protein code sometimes they collectively form the the caspid and then we have the genetic material which is now either the dna or an rna that is generalized structure of a virus but we are going to look at specific viruses some few examples and then we can continue now we have a virus that causes hep zoster have you heard about hep zoster no 
you've seen those who are probably HIV positive. Do you see that there are some wounds that normally develop abnormally in their faces, some swellings, huh? some kind of rough, rough things that come in the skin? Yes. Those were, eh? Some abnormal yes. wounds that sometimes are around the private parts, around the armpits, that is hep zoster. Eh? Now, the virus that causes it is called the HEPs. And when you look at the detailed structure is what I have put for you. Remember, all viruses have three main parts. One is the envelope. And this envelope is normally got from the host cell. That means that this HEP zoster, if it doesn't enter a human cell, the virus, it cannot be effective. Then it has a caspid layer, which now protects the genetic material. These caspid proteins, they actually form part of that inner envelope. And then we have the DNA, which is a genetic material. So that is briefly the structure of the HEPs, what? Structure of, uh, of the HEPs virus. Now we look at uh, the structure of a pox virus. You've heard about smallpox, eh? Yes. So a smallpox also has three layers. You can see the outer membrane. You can see the inner membrane that is brown. That one we also call it the, the caspid. And then you have the genetic material. All viruses have the same. We shall also look at the structure of a coronavirus. Now, all virus consist of three main layers, like I've told you, the core, the caspid, and then the envelope. Very simple structures. When you look at the blue line, is the core, I mean, is the, is the envelope. Then the brown layer is the caspid, and then the core is where we have the genetic material where you are seeing the viron enzymes, the DNA, they form actually part of the caspid. Look at the apes, it's still the same. The envelope is that outer you're seeing with the dotted line. Then that one like a ribbon is the caspid. And then you have the core, which is actually where the DNA is for all viruses, irrespective of the modifications they have so the core is the inner region in which we have the genetic material. It can be DNA or RNA, depending on the type of the virus. And the DNA may also be single-stranded or double-stranded, meaning that if they replicate, they can produce more genome of their same type. Then the caspid is a protective coat, which is a protein, and it is the one that protects the, 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 the core or the genetic material. So they have different units that we now call them capsomeres. Each one of these you are seeing is a capsomere. When you come here, each one of these, where they are divided with that brown line is a capsomere. So for them, they form that layer of proteins that protects the, the genetic material. And then we have the envelope, Envelope is normally found in larger viruses. They are not common in all other viruses. Now, when you look at specifically the human immunovirus, which is the HIV virus, it has only the RNA, and then it replicates in actively dividing T4 lymphocytes, and then they can remain in lymphocyte cells for a certain period. By the way, HIV virus has a unique ability to destroy the T4 lymph helper cells. The T4 is actually found in our lymphocytes or in our lymphatic system. Once they enter into the red blood cells, they destroy all the helper cells that produce the antibodies. And because of that, they produce an retroviral effect. A retroviral means that they are able to rapidly multiply. But when you take the antiretroviral, which we call the ARV, it now stops it from multiplying. So once the person gets infected, the HIV virus remains for the rest of the life of that person. So the person may not actually 
show signs of HIV until the viruses multiply very much or very rapidly. By the way, you will listen that the moment you get an infection and then you take what we call the PEP, the post-exposure prophylaxis, it will take the antiretroviral effect on the virus such that it stops all the active sites from destroying the T4 helper cells. And because of that, the person will have the virus, but that virus will not be able to multiply or reproduce. And therefore, the person remains normal for the rest of the life. So if you are involved in some risk-like structures, you take the, 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 the PEP, and then you are able to stop the virus from multi multiplying because you block the sites through which the protein synthesis can occur. Now, when you look at the structure of an HIV virus, it's still the same way. Look at the glycoprotein spike, which forms the envelope. You look at that. That is called the. Are you able to see the capsomere? Yes. Those small, small rings you're seeing are the capsomeres, but then they collectively form a protein coat called the caspid. All of them collectively are called the caspids. You able to see that? Yes. And then we have the genetic material, which is a single-stranded RNA. But remember, it has a reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase means that it is able to self-replicate. And that's why when you talk about reverse transcriptase, if you want to prevent it from multiplying, you put the antiretroviral. Are you getting that? Antiretroviral means that it, is, yes. it changes the mode such that it is not capable of producing. So that is the structure of an HIV virus. But when you want to simplify it, you, you look at that simple nature. Uh huh. Look at the outer envelope. That outer envelope is actually made of a protein or a glycoprotein. It is actually called the viral envelope. Are you able to see it? Yes. Now look at the inner, the blue one, the light blue type. What do you call that structure? Uh-huh. 